In this lesson, we are going to be talking about innominates and innominate somatic dysfunction. This lesson, as well as the two that will follow it, which will be sacral and cranial, these three topics collectively tend to give medical students a ton of headaches when it comes to memorizing information for complex. So pay special attention to everything that I mentioned in this video. I think our conversation should begin with a discussion of the local anatomy. The first high yield anatomical area to, to think about is the iliolumbar ligament. This ligament stabilizes anterior motion of L5 on the pelvis. So it's kind of like the equivalent of the ACL in the knee, but in the pelvis. The reason this is so high yield, especially for complex and in class exams, is because the iliolumbar ligament is usually the first ligament injured in innominate somatic dysfunction. So if you're taking complex and you get a question that says or describes innominate somatic dysfunction, maybe they won't explicitly tell you that there's innominate somatic dysfunction, but they'll give you some findings which will be highly suggestive of that. They could ask a question such as which of the following structures is the first to be injured? And you need to know that the answer is the iliolumbar ligament. Or perhaps if the test writer is feeling extra spunky that day, they're going to ask you a second or third order question. And they'll say, which of the following structures is the first to be injured? And instead of naming the ligaments by name, maybe they only give you the attachments or something like that. So you want to know about the iliolumbar ligament. You want to understand where it runs. I've circled it here in red for your, your studying pleasure. And you need to know that it stabilizes the anterior motion of L5 on the pelvis but first and foremost, know that it's the first ligament injured whenever you have innominate somatic dysfunction. Another high yield ligament is the sacrospinous ligament. This ligament, which you see circled in red on this slide, separates the greater and lesser sciatic foramen. And for that reason, it shows up on exams, so know it. Let's talk about the piriformis muscle. So you've, you've heard me talk a little bit about the piriformis uh, if you've watched the counter strain videos. The piriformis muscle, its action is abduction and external rotation. It's innervated by S1 to S2, and it has attachments on the anterior surface of the sacrum as well as the greater trochanter. Now, the reason that the piriformis muscle is extremely high yield for complex and your in-class osteopathic exams is because of its relationship with the sciatic nerve. So on this slide, I've highlighted in red the sciatic nerve. And as you can see here, that sciatic nerve runs beneath the belly of the, of the piriformis. And what that means is that anytime you have somatic dysfunction of the piriformis, that piriformis can get a little you know, big and beefy and then impinge upon the sciatic nerve. So lay people refer to that as sciatica, which you as a future physician will say is a radicular injury that creates neuropathic pain in the distribution of the sciatic nerve. Okay, so it's a very high yield anatomical association that you need to know. And this could come up on complex in the form of an explicit piriformis somatic dysfunction. So they could just say that, or they could allude to it. They could say that somebody was sitting on their wallet for too long or something like that. So you want to be familiar with where the piriformis attaches because depending on whatever kind of occupational exposure or you know whatever the person is doing, such as sitting on a wallet, you need to know that the piriformis muscle is having somatic dysfunction and then take that one step further and infer that you could have sciatica. Okay, so very, very high yield. Please know the piriformis muscle. The next muscle we should talk about is actually a combination of two muscle groups. It's the iliopsoas. So the iliopsoas is com comprised of the iliacus plus the psoas muscles. And you see both of them here. But because collectively these muscles are responsible for hip flexion, people often group them together. So the iliopsoas is innervated from L1 to L3. It has attachments from the transverse processes of T12 down to L5. It also attaches on the anterior pelvis and then goes down to the lesser trochanter. Really, all I need you to take from this slide is that the iliopsoas is the main hip flexor, okay? Main hip flexor, that's all. So that does it for anatomy. We're going to switch gears and just touch on sacral motion.
So there are technically three different axes in the sacrum, and each of those different axes is responsible for a different type of motion. So the first of the three is the superior sacral axis. And at the superior sacral axis, you get craniosacral and respiratory motion. The second of the three axes is the medial sacral axis. At the medial sacral axis, you get postural motion. And the third of the three is the inferior sacral axis. And it's at this axis that you get innominate motion. So because this video is on innominates and innominate somatic dysfunction, the abnormality in motion that may arise if you have somatic dysfunction will be at the inferior sacral axis. So memorize these three axes, know what type of motion is happening at each of the three, because on Comlex, you could be given a question where they describe some alteration in, for example, craniosacral mechanics, and then they ask you which axis does that occur at, and you would need to know that it's superior because it's craniosacral. Or they might give you some type of axial postural problem, and you would need to know that it's medial, etc., etc. So understand these three sacral motions. Just for completeness sake, I'll show you visually kind of what this looks like. So if you imagine the pelvic and sacral area as just this 2D box, I apologize, it's very crude, but if you, if, it's, if you look at this 2D box and then you draw these three axes over them, you've got your superior, medial, and inferior axis. The last thing that I want to say, and I'll put it in this conversation, although it'll be much more relevant in the video on sacral dysfunction, is that there's actually two oblique axes as well. There's the right oblique axis and the left oblique axis. I'll touch on this again in the future video on sacral dysfunctions, but I'm just going to include it here since we're talking about all of the axes that run through the pelvic or sacral region. Now we're going to talk about innominate somatic dysfunction. And in order to dominate innominate somatic dysfunction on Comlex, on in-class exams, on in-class practicals, you need to understand your landmarks. So there's actually a super, super easy way to get all of these questions right. And when I say get all of these questions right, I mean with 100% accuracy. And you're going to use your hands as little models. And the great thing about when you're taking Comlex is that you, are, you obviously have your hands when you're in the testing center. So you're allowed to use your hands as models and get these questions right when you're taking your exam. So what you want to do is you want to take your hands and almost make two, like you're holding two guns. And in doing that, you want to point your middle fingers at one another. And the different landmarks on your hands are what you see on this slide. So your pointer fingers represent the ASIS on either side. Your thumbs, which are pointing up, represent the PSIS. And your middle fingers, which are pointing toward one another, represent your, your pubic bones. Okay, so know these three landmarks because in just a second, we'll talk about innominate dysfunction. And we'll use our hands as models to figure out what type of findings we have in each of the dysfunctions. And you're going to get all of these questions right 100% of the time with this really silly method. Before we go any further, in addition to landmarks, you just have to understand the standing flexion test. The standing flexion test is an incredibly high yield and important topic to understand because the result of this test localizes the innominate somatic dysfunction. So this will make a lot more sense when we go through the individual examples of innominate dysfunction. But just briefly, I will preface that discussion by saying, if you have a standing flexion test positive on the left side, that means it's the left-sided innominate that is the dysfunction. And why this matters, again, if you're confused as I say this, I want you to take a deep breath and not worry about it because this will be more clear in the rest of this video, but let's say that you didn't know the standing flexion test result, okay? And on one side, let's say on the right side, the innominate and all of its landmarks was up in the air, but on the left side, the innominate and all of its landmarks was down, like closer to the ground. You wouldn't know without the standing flexion test whether the right side has a superior dysfunction or the left side has an inferior dysfunction. Because relatively speaking, when you compare them to one another, one is up and one is down. So how do you know which side is the dysfunction? Or how do you know which side is deviating from relative normal or relative midline? And that's what the standing flexion test tells you. So the takeaway is that the whichever side the standing flexion test is positive on will localize and tell you that it's that side that has the 
innate or etiology of the innominate somatic dysfunction. Okay, so going into this conversation on innominate somatic dysfunction, you need to know the landmarks that you're going to use on your hand, and you need to understand what the standing flexion test tells you. If you feel comfortable with that, let's move forward and start talking about the individual innominate somatic dysfunctions. The first is rotation dysfunctions. So when you have an innominate rotation, the dysfunction can be an anterior rotation or a posterior rotation. We're going to go through all of these examples one at a time and talk about what changes we expect to find in our landmarks. So let's start with the anterior innominate rotation. So in an anterior innominate rotation, you, you have your two hands, right? You're holding up like kind of the gun sign. Your middle fingers are pointing at one another. And on one side, the innominate will rotate anteriorly. So if you look at this example, you see that on the right side, there's no deviation from normal. But on that left side, that left innominate rotates anteriorly. So when you're holding your hands up, you rotate your left hand anteriorly and then look at your landmarks, right? Your ASIS, which again is represented by your pointer finger, will now be more inferior. Your PSIS, which is represented by your thumb, should be slightly superior. The standing flexion test, because this is a left side innominate problem, will be positive on the left. And then the last little high yield nugget here is that this is due to quadriceps tightness, right? So your quads are on the anterior part of your leg and your hamstrings are on the posterior part, which means in an anterior dysfunction, some muscular hypertonicity or just general somatic dysfunction is tight and pulling that innominate anteriorly. So if it's an anterior rotation and the, the question asks you which of the following muscle groups is implicated, the answer is the quads because it's pulling that innominant anteriorly. So again, if this is a little confusing, pause the video and try this with your hands. But as you hold your hands up using your landmarks, you rotate that left hand or that left innominate anteriorly. Your ASIS drops and your PSIS should just go up a teeny, teeny bit compared to the other side. Again, this is due to quadriceps tightness. And then the standing flexion test is positive on the left because it's the left hand or the left innominate that's rotating. Okay, that's an anterior innominate rotation. Let's talk about the opposite. Let's talk about a posterior innominate rotation. So in a posterior innominate rotation, hold your hands up, right? One side, we'll, we'll again go with the left side, will rotate posteriorly. So you can see that that hand on the right really hasn't deviated from its neutral or midline plane, but the left hand or the left innominate is rotating posteriorly. So what would you expect to find? Well, because it's the left hand or the left innominate, the standing flexion test should be positive on the left. It's not the right side that's dysfunctional, it's the left side. When that left hand or left innominate rotates posteriorly, your ASIS, represented by your pointer finger, moves up or superiorly. Your PSIS, represented by your thumb, drops and moves inferiorly. And just like we talked about in the anterior rotation, if it's a posterior rotation, the muscle that's implicated could be the hamstrings because the hamstrings are on the posterior aspect of the lower extremity. And if they're tight, they'll pull that innominate backwards as they tighten up and get dysfunctional. So those are rotations. You have an anterior and a posterior. If you can use your hands as models, it's pretty straightforward. Let's move on to another type of innominate somatic dysfunction. Now we're going to talk about shears. A shear can either be a superior shear or an inferior shear, and we'll start with superior. If you hold your hands out and use your landmarks, a superior innominate shear is just one side completely moving superiorly relative to the other. So in this example, we see a left innominate superior shear, which is to say that the left hand moves up. So because this is the left innominate, we know that the standing flexion test will be positive on the left. Everything's moving up here. So our ASIS, represented by the pointer finger, moves up. The PSIS, represented by the thumb, moves up. And as far as a potential cause of this dysfunction, this may be due to landing on the buttocks. So if you fall flat on your butt and that force vector pushes all of the innominate up as your force in your body is going down into the floor, you can displace that left innominate superiorly. And then you have the findings of a superior shear. If you're comfortable with this, let's talk about the opposite. Let's talk 
inferior in nominant shears. So this is just the opposite. If you use your landmarks, everything's moving inferiorly. So in this example, we see a left in nominant inferior shear, which is to say that we expect the standing flexion test to be positive on the left because it's the left side that's dysfunctional. And because everything drops down, our ASIS represented by the pointer finger is inferior and our PSIS represented by the thumb is also inferior. And you can see that when you compare that left side to the right and you look at that nice white neutral plane, the right side isn't moving, it's the left side that's dropping down. So those are shears. You've got superior and inferior shears. Let's talk about flare dysfunctions. So the final type of innominate dysfunction is a flare. A flare can be an in-flare where things move medially or an out-flare where things move laterally. Let's start with the in-flare. In an in-flare, one side is rotating medially. So you see in our model here that the right hand isn't changing. You see the white plane, that's the neutral. But that left hand is moving medially. So what do we expect to find? Well, first, because it's the left innominant that is the dysfunctional side, the standing flexion test is positive on the left. Now for flares, it's important to differentiate the ASIS from something called the ischial tuberosity. In a flare, whether it's an in-flare or an out-flare, the ASIS and the ischial tuberosity will move opposite of one another. So if the ASIS, which is represented again by the pointer finger, moves medially, which may be written on COMLEX or your exams as closer to the umbilicus, right, moving closer to midline or medially, then that means the ischial tuberosity, which must be doing the opposite, moves laterally or further from the umbilicus. So this is an inflare where one side moves medially the ASIS moves closer to the belly button, closer to the midline, and the ischial tuberosity does the opposite and moves laterally. Now, what I will say to you is that on COMLEX, on your in-class exams, or whatever test you're taking, the test writer might not be as explicit as saying the ASIS moves closer to the umbilicus. They might actually give you a measurement. So they could say something like, for example, findings include the ASIS on the left, being three centimeters from the umbilicus, um, the ASIS on the right being whatever centimeters from the umbilicus. And what they're showing you is a difference in the measurements. And from that, you can infer which side is moving closer or which side has the dysfunctional side when paired with the standing flexion test. So this is an in-flare. And if you're comfortable with this, let's talk about the out-flare. So perhaps unsurprisingly, this is the opposite. This is when one hand or one innominate moves more laterally. So in an example here, you see a left innominate out flare. So the left side is gonna be, the standing flexion test will be positive on the left because it's the left side that's dysfunctional. Now, if we have a left out flare, the ASIS on the left will be further from the umbilicus, right? Because the pointer finger moves more laterally. It's moving further away from midline, further away from the belly button. And therefore, because the ischial tuberosity always, always, always acts opposite the ASIS, the ischial tuberosity will move more medially or closer to the umbilicus or closer to the midline. Okay, so this is the outflare. It's just the opposite. So that does it for innominance and innominate somatic dysfunction. Just to recap, we had rotations where one side moves forward or back. We had shears where one side totally moves superior or inferior and we had flares where an in flare is medial and an out flare is lateral this is all you need to know for innominates and innominate somatic dysfunction remember your landmarks use your hands and you'll get 100 percent of these questions right